Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 10K Project. We are all about building black wealth here. We want to say hello to everyone who has joined us for this special occasion. This is, um, I think this is our first really big major guest with our Building Black Wealth series. So we're very excited to have Lilia Bundles here today. She is the great-great-granddaughter of Madam C.J. Walker, only America's first female millionaire, Madam C.J. Walker. Not just black millionaire, but female millionaire, period, self-made. So we're very excited to have Lilia here today with us to talk about black economics, her family's legacy, Maybe she'll tell us a little bit about some of the things that the movie got incorrect. We'll see if we can pull a couple of gems out of her for that. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we also have the chat here. You're also able to ask questions as well. So I want to uh, acknowledge people. We have uh, people putting in their city and state here. So we have... Tampa, Chicago, Frederick, Maryland, Fort Worth, Texas, Los Angeles, uh, Hebron, Kentucky, hope I said that right, Mount Vernon, New York, Wharton, New Jersey, Baltimore, uh, Norwich, Connecticut, Atlanta, Greensboro, North Carolina, Berkeley, California, Miami, Smyrna, Tennessee, Plymouth Meeting, uh, Pennsylvania, Portland, Oregon, um, Vallejo, California, Bowie, Maryland, Richmond, Virginia, Atlanta, Columbus, Newark, New Jersey, New, New Jersey, sorry, Cleveland, Columbus, Birmingham, Alabama, Fairfax, Virginia, Fresno, California. We have Texas here, Dallas, Fort Worth, Tallahassee, Brooklyn, Edgewater, New Jersey. We have so many more people uh, saying where you're coming from. So Indiana. North Carolina, welcome to everybody. And um, somebody is saying that they're only seeing my avatar here. So I'm going to work on my technical issues over here, but I am going to uh, ask Ms. Bundles to introduce herself, tell us about herself while I figure out what's happening with my camera. So welcome. So I'm just so delighted to be here. Um, my good friend Neil connected us, and so we have that small world journalism thing going on. But I was so excited. I actually had um, followed your Instagram page before you reached out to me because I liked what you were trying to do. And this is so important that we create generational wealth in our families and uh, you have a really incredible team. So I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of the conversation. So in terms of me, uh, I have a 30-year career in network television news as a producer with NBC and then as a producer and an executive with ABC News. Uh, so I had that corporate life uh, and that writing was my passion that led me to that. Uh, but I have been gone from that corporate scene for more than a decade. And I began to write about Madam Walker, my great-great-grandmother, um, really in high school 50 years ago when I was a senior in high school, but then with, in earnest when I was a student at Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism in the mid-70s. And my advisor, Phyllis Garland, the only black woman on the faculty, recognized my name, Alelia, and asked if I had any connection to Madam C.J. Walker. I think she knew the answer, but I wasn't walking around talking about my family at that point. Mm -hmm. And Phyllis being the wise person that she was uh, when I gave her some lame topics for my uh, uh, master's project, she said, uh, your name is Alilia. Do you have a connection to Madam Walker? That's what you're going to write about. So that really set me on, on this path that has now turned into four books and connections with a company that manufactures Madam Walker inspired projects and National Historic Landmarks and of course more recently a self-made the four-part Netflix series uh, based on Madam Walker's life based on my book on her own ground the life and times of Madam CJ Walker. Well that is a phenomenal of course I, I was so excited when Neil uh, put us together and uh, also Equally as excited when I saw the number of registrants and the number of people that were interested. And I don't think it's just because of the movie. I think that people are reconnecting with 
uh, black empowerment, with black economics. And I'd love for you to, um, to, you know, talk with us about that from your perspective, from your family history, and, um, you know, anything you have to say with regards to that. Because um, I, I see the surge of people that are saying, you know what, let's start getting our, our economics together and let's start practicing group economics and also figuring out how we can um, help each other in order to thrive. So what do you think with regards to that? So, you know, I'll start with the kind of my nuclear family and then spread out to Madam Walker and some of the lessons that we all, I think, can learn for, from her. Uh, but my mother, uh, who I'm named after, Alelia, and she's the second Alelia. Madam Walker's daughter was Alelia Walker. Then my mother was Alelia Mae Perry, and I'm Alelia Perry Bundle. So, but my mother, when I was growing up, was vice president of the Madam C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company in Indianapolis. And so I would go with her to her office sometimes and, you know, see that this beautiful block long flat iron building where the Walker Company was based and where there's a a theater and that has recently been renovated uh, into a lovely cultural arts center. But my mother, both my parents were in the hair care business. My father had worked for a couple of years after my parents got married in the early 1950s for the Walker Company and he was actually hired away by a company called Summit Laboratories. He was president. So technically, my parents were competitors in business, in, both in the hair care business. But by that time, the Walker Company really had declined. It wasn't a major player uh, in the space of hair care products. And at that point, it had been, you know, Madam Walker, her rival Annie Malone, and Sarah Spencer Washington the other black woman who was a big giant of the hair care industry in the early 20th century who had founded the Apex Company. But by the 1950s, all three of those companies really had been, as we now say, disrupted because it was the chemical hair straighteners like Summit Labs, Johnson Products, Soft Sheen, those companies that had reimagined black women and hair. So for better or worse, that is where things were. But I grew up with parents who were entrepreneurs, um, but my, they wanted me to follow my dreams, and my dream was to be a writer. I became a journalist because that was the avenue open for you know, a young Black woman who'd like to be a writer at that point when I graduated from college in the early 1970s. Hollywood was not yet an open very much you know, to, for me. So I went into news, but I was following this um, path of telling the family story. So while I didn't work in the family business because that was not my passion, I have ended up, I think, keeping Madam Walker's legacy alive in a way that I wouldn't have done if I had felt forced in the family business. So sometimes people will say to me, how could you not have done that? But I, would have, I don't think I would have been good at that. I think there are other people who are better at that. I was good at what I did. And now I'm trying, and now I am hoping that what I do is inspire others. One of the great uh, responses to self made is that a lot of people, especially because it came out that first weekend when we were all stuck at home because of the pandemic, it made people reactivate their side hustles. And I think we are now seeing we are in such a really challenging and difficult moment uh, with the um, economy, with people losing jobs, with people not being, you know, people who had started jobs, not sure how those jobs, how those companies are going to uh, survive. So this is a really good time to talk about some of the lessons that, that Madam Walker um, has to offer us. So I don't want to just keep going on and on. I'd like to get like you to ask me a few questions and then I can talk some more about Madam Walker. Sure, and, and I'm also, you know, anytime my co-founders want to get in here as well, because this is, we wanted this to be more of a conversation and not just like a straight interview too. We also see, are starting to see some uh, comments and, and things coming up in the chat. So if people think of questions or comments, please feel free uh, to put those in the chat as well. Uh, so one of the let, let's be a little controversial here, right? Uh, I, I like just a smidge of controversy. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about within the 10K project, and I've 
spoken with individual members, spoke with a good girlfriend of mine yesterday uh, about this or a couple of days ago, is the fact that unlike the Hiltons and the Waltons that tend to have three, four, five, six generations of generational wealth, it's very difficult for us to find um, black families like that. Um, and my friend was saying, you know, I Googled it because she joined the 10K Project, and she was just curious about it from a generational wealth point of view. And she said, it, you know, she was not able to find a black family that had generational wealth similar to, like, the Hiltons and the Waltons and the people that we know. So, you know, in your research, because you're a historian, you also come from uh, the family that you come from, what are your comments with regards to this? And I also want to ask this from a point of view of we have a lot of parents in here. We have a lot of parents in the 10K project that are not just joining 10K for themselves. They're joining for their kids and grandkids, et cetera. I'd love to hear your perspective with regards to that thought process because a lot of people have it. So, so we'll talk about the, the generational wealth. Why do we not see more generational wealth in our families? And I think that, you know, we beat ourselves up about this and it would be great if we could find more examples, but I think it is really important for us to realize that our uh, attempts at generational wealth have been sabotaged. So that when we see that people, home ownership, uh, we know that from Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, and there's a newer book written by a brother who's at, uh, at, in, um, in Ohio and whose name I can't think of right now, but I heard him on NPR the other day who's also written about this, that when our families bought property, as we know, because of redlining and because banks wouldn't lend money, that those neighborhoods deteriorated. They lost value. If we had, when we bought the same houses for the same prices in the 1950s, when my father, my parents' generation, when those guys were coming back from Korea and from um, World War II, if they paid $30,000 for a house in a neighborhood that was predominantly black with the same quality of housing, and a white family paid $30,000 in Levittown where black people were excluded, Levitt, a house in Levittown is now worth three or four or $500,000. Our neighborhoods are underwater. And that was a federal policy from the FHA. That was a banking policy that was intentional that our neighborhoods would be deteriorated. And then during the 1950s, when highways cut through so many black neighborhoods that further diminished the value of our homes. So we had that and then of course, through in 2008 when the economy collapsed and all of those you know sort of fake um, financial instruments that targeted our community so it's it's not to say that we don't that that they're not some responsibility on our part but i will say that if we we should not say black people just didn't create generational wealth what is wrong with us so there are reasons why this happened and in terms of my thoughts about you know, how to connect this to Madam Walker. One of the things I think that made her different from her competitors is that she expanded beyond just the making of hair care products. That when she had her convention in, her first convention in 1917, she was really looking at women and trying to help them become economically independent. It's like, yes, great. We have a hair care product. It works for us. We need to sell that hair care product, but we need to use those sales and we need to use our organization to create wealth. And, she, and education was key for her and buying homes was key for her. She, had, she built homes. She tried to help other people finance homes. And she knew that education and real estate and ownership, land ownership, home ownership, those were the twin pillars of creating wealth. She did not anticipate that there would be redlining and that our neighborhoods would be destroyed. You know, from my own right. um, family, certainly, you know, the, the Walker Company really suffered during the Depression and, you know, sort of made its way back up. But I would say that for my family, education was critical. And it's not, you just, 
education, but I didn't have loans. I didn't have student loans. And that, while that was, while I did not have a trust fund, I did have a situation where my tuition was paid so that when I graduated, I did not have debt. And that is a, that is a huge problem for, for our communities now. Right, because we are told to get our education. So all of us uh, here on the, uh, you know, as far as the 10K project are either mid-40s or early 50s, and we were told at that time the only way you can get out is, you know, not get out, but, you know, to survive and to thrive is to get education. And it wasn't just a high school education. It was a master's. My mother was trying to get me to get a doctorate. You know, Dr. Keisha has a doctorate degree. And then now we're looking back and we're like, oh, wow, but we also have all the student debt that came with it where our counterparts don't. Um, so I know that you mentioned that you looked at our website, the 10K Project, so I'm going to put a plug in, but it's more so a plug of, okay, so where do we go from here, right? Um, so I want to tell everyone what the 10K Project is, and then I'm going to ask um, Ms. Bundles to talk from her perspective of some of the things that she thinks that we as a community should do while um, leveraging the 10K project in order to help uh, build black wealth and generational wealth. So the 10K project is the largest community of black investors who are funding black businesses for as little as $100 per investment. And the concept is simple. When 10,000 of us get together, we put in $100 each, that's a million dollars. We can start funding our own businesses. We can profit from our own innovation. We can create jobs in our community, and we can help build black wealth and hopefully help close the wealth gap. So we, uh, the technical term for what we're doing and the law that we're using is the Jobs Act of 2012. And what we're doing is something called equity crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has been done by our people for centuries, right? Um, it, people have heard me before talking about my grandmother in the Black Baptist Church and the building fund. It's the same type of thing where the pastor would get up. He would say, members, we need $10,000 in order to fix the roof, and we're going to pass around the offering plate. And, you know, everybody would put in a certain amount of money, and next thing you know, the roof is paid for. That's crowdfunding. However, with equity crowdfunding, instead of us just giving money to businesses and donating money to businesses, now we get equity or shares or partial ownership in those businesses. And we're starting to become strategic in terms of the types of businesses that will be on our platform and that we will fund. So our platform is governed by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, all right? We have to be fingerprinted as co-founders. We have to have back FBI background checks, all of that. Uh, also, the businesses that come on our platform also have to go through SEC uh, guidelines and things like that. And then we will also have some additional um, uh, requirements for companies that want to be on the platform. But we're looking at certain industries. We're looking at certain types of businesses. You definitely have to have a scalable business, a business that can grow, that can um, be either you know, go on the stock exchange one day or be sold so that you can make the investors whole or something that makes so much money that a company is able to start giving dividends or profits to the investors. And um, we're being very strategic with the conversations we're having within our community. So now that I've given everyone that overview, um, Ms. Bundles, I, you, like you said, you, you went, you took a look at the website, and you seem to be on board with what we're doing. I'd love to hear from your perspective some of your thoughts about the 10K Project and how everyone in the community can really leverage what we're doing. Well, I, I think you are, you know, absolutely, this has been going on in our community for centuries, whether it was benevolent societies, burial societies that were going on, um, even during the antebellum eras with among free people of color, people were pooling their money. And what you are doing now with this uh, SEC um, endorsement is you're, you're, you've created trust because I think anytime people are talking about their money, that is a really critical. 
um, that they feel that, that, that whatever they put up is going to be used and is going to be managed. And we can see with some of the philanthropy circles, the giving circles that we've seen other people in our community putting in $100, $1,000, managing that portfolio, watching it grow so that there can be, <laughs> excuse me, some support of charitable organizations. But what you're really talking about, of course, is in some ways a kind of a venture capital model, but that allows people to get in at a much smaller amount um, so that they can really see it. So I think that it is, if people will send, you know, a hundred dollars to um, a crowdsource fund to, to buy something, uh, or to, and, and understandably to support a defense fund or to support a burial fund, <coughs> excuse me, for people. But to be able to say that you're watching a business grow seems to me to be a perfect way, you know, because in, many, in many of our families, we don't grow up with this sense of owning stock or monitoring it. And if you could see that your $100 or your $500 or your $1,000 is helping to grow a business, I think that's a great education for people. I guess, you know, one of the things that I don't know from reading from reading the website is how when like six months out or a year out, how do how are people able to see what their investment has done? That's a great question. So the SEC has guidelines with regards to uh, the reporting frequency. Uh, that the companies have to do and how they report. Similar to how a public company, a company on the stock exchange, has to have their annual reports. A lot of times they'll have quarterly reports as well. Well, you will have that within the companies within the platform because once companies raise money through equity crowdfunding, they are governed by the SEC and they have to follow those rules. So that's actually one of the interesting things you're mentioning because one of the things we encourage people to do if they have kids and their kids seem to be very interested in a specific industry or a specific business and they've decided to fund it is that they will get the uh, newsletters and the updates from those entrepreneurs and the kids now are able to see that entrepreneur's journey from startup to growth. And a lot of times that can be very inspiring and our kids can see industries and opportunities that just did. So, and I will open it up for the rest of my uh, panel here if you all have any questions you wanna ask. Certainly, I would love to know specifically just tagging off of the watching someone grow a business. I think because you came from an entrepreneurial family, how did that impact you? And what do you, you know, how did, what parts did you take, even though you went in, like you said, into a corporate environment, what are those still those elements that were definitely cross pollinated for you uh, to make you successful in your career? So, you know, I, people ask me if I, if I consider myself an entrepreneur and I will say I have an entrepreneurial spirit yes. because <laughs> unless, you, unless you are staying up at night worrying about whether you are meeting payroll, you have not, you are not a real entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but both of my parents, um, you know, worked very hard. I mean, it is 24 seven. You are always thinking about ways to, to grow the business, ways to, mo I mean, motivate employees. I have managed people, but that's not the same as actually owning the business and making sure that you're paying the taxes. And, but all of those things are really, uh, really important having a really having an attorney which people think they don't really want to pay for but you really must create that infrastructure and I think I learned that from studying Madam Walker's life that you know she would say first you have to have a great product and then you have to market that product but then it's also you surround yourself with and as I say when I read your bios I thought what a great team because everybody brings something different to the table and that was what Madam Walker was doing with her C-suite, so to speak, with her attorney, um, with her who allowed her to, who crossed the T's and dotted the I's and kept away the, you know, the threats so that she could be the visionary with the manager of her factory. The, the woman who managed her factory had been a dean of girls at a black boarding school. So she could manage other people. She could motivate other people. So I think that's, um, you know, having that infrastructure uh, in addition to your great product is 
is important. But yes, being an entrepreneur is 24-7. <laughs> You know, 365 too. <laughs> yes. I have a question. Ahead, yes, I have a question. And, and this is such an honor to speak with you, I tell you. Um, I, what I wanted to tap into is really the what I'm hearing you say um, when you had the opportunity to actually go your path. So you are bringing up a point about freedom. It's, that's the freedom that we want to give our kids. I often talk about how, you know, our parents did the best they could, you know, for us. I'm, I'm from a working class family myself and they did the best they could. So, you know, I did the education thing, but here I am, you know, I still got to do something with the education to have it meet, be meaningful. But what I'd like to be able to do for my children is to be able to, you know, give them, um, you know, uh, generational wealth where they have the freedom really to not feel pressured to do what I did necessarily. So, you know, what was that like just to, you know, be a part of a family where that was even an option? You know, mm -hmm. some of us just don't have that being a first generation, you know. You know, and I'm, I, I saw that my friend, Dr. Gloria Murray, asked a question that kind of syncs up with what you're saying. Um, she is saying, what about people who say, well, I, you know, I, I don't really want to give my children something because maybe they'll waste it or maybe they won't, you know, maybe they'll be spoiled. And I just, you know, so to your point, how we really look at the next generation. I, some years ago, I went to a weekend that Northern Trust hosted for some high net worth African-American clients a number of people who had made a lot of money, some first generation, some second and third generation. But there were a, at least a couple of seminars on how you train your children. And a friend of mine who does, a, who's, who's actually white, but who does a lot of work with high net worth individuals, advises wealthy people and their children. And she was telling a story that one of her clients um, wanted their son, teenage son, to get a summer job. And, and not only were his friends teasing him, the other parents were questioning why they would have their kid get a summer job when, they didn't need, when he didn't need the money, when the parents could give him everything. And the parents said, this is exactly why we're doing this, because we need you to understand the value of hard work. And so I always had summer jobs. I, you know, I always had, you know, whether it was babysitting or, you know, a couple of summers I worked in my father's office. Now that was a privilege to be able to go work in your father's office, but I knew that I needed to work harder than anybody else because I was the boss's daughter, that it wasn't about me half-stepping. Mm -hmm. So I think it is really instilling those values in kids so that they know, they need to know what you do. They need to understand what you're doing um, and they need to know how to make their own money and they need to have their own path. And sometimes that path may align with yours, uh, we can see with the president of the United States that nepotism is not a good idea. But, <laughs> but our, kids, our kids need to find you know, the thing that really works for them. And sometimes, you know, I've seen people who have their own businesses and, and, and some African-Americans and they, have, they make their kids go do something else first and then come back. Yeah. Um, so I just think it's it's really important to have those experiences. But you're right. If you if you if you're able to mostly pay for their education so that they are um, that they graduate without a huge amount of debt, that is the hugest gift you can give a kid. There's no kidding. No kidding. I'm still paying my loans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I I have a, a woman friend of mine, white woman. Um, she was telling me that when her son graduated from college, I'm sure they paid because she and her husband made a good amount of money. So I'm sure that they paid, you know, for him to go to college. So he had no student loans. And then the minute he stepped off the graduation stage, she was a mortgage broker and she got him a house and she had him sign the mortgage paperwork and paid the down payment. And then he and two other friends moved in there and the two other friends were paying the mortgage for him. And then a few years later, the young man decided to get married and they, he had that residence as a rental property and moved to another residence with his bride, you know, and 
how great I think it would be for parents to – now, this young man, obviously, he did work hard. Like, I, I know him enough to know that he was a hard worker. He had great parents that instilled um, great work ethic in him. But how they set him up so that by the time – like, I bought my house at 41 – Right. But if my father had done that with me, how much farther would I have been, you know, and my father would have had the, he would have had the 3% to give me, you know, so I come from a little bit of of privilege, um, not a whole lot, but a little bit. But I do think that certain times maybe parents do want to consider those types of things, or even if you don't have the 3%, but you're able to get your child who's graduating from college and they've got their first good job into, like you say, okay, let's go to this home ownership um, seminar just to learn what your options are, you know, and things like that. I think that even just giving young people the education that they need so that when they are ready, they, they have something that they're working towards, and when they are ready, they're able to have – uh, the foundation and the network and the people that they need uh, to start life off right. So, you know, I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in with regards to that. But yeah, sure. You're really talking the things we should think about. Yeah, you're you're really you're bringing up the uh, point of cultural capital. You know, you know, if there's nothing we can't pass along, no matter what our station is. You know, um, and I'm I'm gonna really mean that. Like, I, I know there are other people who are probably listening to us and thinking like, oh man, well, you know, I'm really struggling, you know, some people might be, but, you know, that cultural capital piece really does go forward, you know, um, just, just being that person, there, there's just so many stories, you know, where people really struggled prior to, but, you know, taking their child to the, to the museum or to the library or, you know, just giving them experiences beyond the block, you know, that's huge. That's the oh, first yeah. huge step, you know? So when they, you know, find people like ours, like us, you know, and um, programs like this, they see the value immediately, you know, because it's, they, they know that it's, it takes more than one person to really do these kind of huge projects. So. Well, and the right. financial literacy, it really does have to start um, at, as you know, at a really young age and you, yeah. and every child is not going to absorb the message you know, in my household, but you know, my brothers and you know, who I love, and may they rest in peace because they are now gone. But I clearly was the one who paid attention to the lessons of paying your credit card bills on time. And everybody doesn't get it. So you have to really, you know, see what is what is your child's capacity for paying, for paying attention. And, and I will say that in my family, my mother's father's family, family, my mother's family, her father was truly a child of privilege, born in 1892, whose parents had gone to college. He was an attorney. His father had been a merchant and owned a funeral home. But my grandfather had a little bit of a gambling thing, and he played the stock market and the horses. So, <laughs> but my father's father, who had very little education, but who was a laborer on the Pennsylvania Railroad and raised nine children, during the uh, depression uh, had a pension and he was a hustler. He always had a side, many, many side hustles. So at the end of their lives, one had more money in the bank than the other. And it wasn't the one who had grown up with privilege. So it's like, how do you use those lessons? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eric, you haven't talked. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I, I do have a question, Ms. Bundles, and this is, Sheree started it because Sheree mentioned controversy, so this is going to be controversial. So now, you know, having such a rich heritage, um, especially in the black hair care industry, how do you feel when you look at the current state of the industry itself, where, this is be honest, it's not controlled primarily by black folks. And yet, um, you know, we are the primary, the number one consumers of the product itself. Um, how do you feel about that? Because, of course, like the, the conversation has come up before in a lot of our groups about entrepreneurs um, that do want to enter in um, into this, uh, you know, black cosmetic beauty and hair care industry. But but like, what is your take on that? Because I many times, to be honest with you, I get a real pain in my stomach when I 
see that and know that that is how things are happening? You want, you know, it's really, really complicated. <laughs> so <Yeah>. I, <laughs> and so I have lived long enough um, to have seen this, and you know, the many, many cycles of this where uh, historically black businesses, black owned businesses, but even Madam Walker, Annie Malone and Sarah Spencer Washington were the black owned, the three premier black -owned companies during the first half of the 20th century. But even then, people like to say they were using those products, but they would rather 15 cents for um, the cheaper Vaseline or other products and not pay 35 cents for the, comp the companies that were owned by black women. So I think people talk an interesting game. So there's that. <laughs> but, um, and then there were always white owned companies trying to buy those companies. Madam Walker founded the National Negro Manufacturers Association in 1918 to try to help protect some of the, the black owned companies, a consortium. So then you move forward into the 1950s when these companies that were manufacturing chemical hair straighteners be, you know disrupted the market and those would that was a series of black owned companies john john and my dad's company summit labs and others and then i know that some of my father's salespeople were hired away by alberto culver and l'oreal oh. and basically you can you can analyze the the chemicals you know you can analyze the formula it's not hard you just go into a lab and then you can remake it. And I do, I remember with my father on Saturdays, he would go to the different uh, drug stores around Indianapolis and he would look to see how many inches on the shelf his products had. But L'Oreal and Alberto Culver and Revlon could dictate a larger amount of space because they were supplying other products. So then we, you know, go forward and the, you know, hair, the wigs really, wigs and extensions really changed it because Asians were able to import. And I could see that happening. I could see my father's company feeling that impact. You know, Afro, that's a whole nother dimension. But then after the riots and the neighborhoods were destroyed, I used to, my, one of my summer jobs was uh, filing the order forms from beauty supplies. And at we, on our vacations, we would go visit whatever city we went to. We had dinner with whoever the black beauty supply company family was. Well, that changed after the neighborhoods were destroyed. And then Koreans came in and took that over and they were there working hard. And I'm not, I'm not trying to get into a, you know, Koreans are bad. I'm not trying to go there. That's not where I'm going. But people, but that disrupted it. And the supply chain of who could import hair, really, of uh, extensions really began to change things. But then I think after, and then L'Oreal, Revlon, they were very predatory about coming in and, and buying some of these black owned companies and basically just putting them on the shelf. Mm -hmm. But then there was the next series. I mean, sometimes some of it is YouTube, some of it is young entrepreneurs with Carol's Daughter, with um, Sundial Brands, with other companies, black owned companies that were developing their own lines and really focusing on the needs of the customers and, and starting from grassroots. And so those companies now have gotten bigger. There are still smaller black owned companies and obviously Sundial Brands, which is the company that manufactures MCJW, Madam Walker line of hair care products that currently is in Sephora. When Sundial was sold to, um, to Unilever a couple of years ago, a lot of people got upset about that. And I, you know, and I know that was, it sort of got lumped in with, you know, why did Carol's daughter do this? Why are people selling? But you know, the, the way that business works in America is that you scale up so you can be bought. And what is the deal that you cut with somebody? Is it, if you're black owned and you are not able to scale up, then you can pay your salaries and you can have a business. But if you, are, if you are sold to another company, but the deal you cut is that there will continue to be investment in the black community, which is what mm -hmm. happens with Sundial and with their community commerce, then maybe you are creating a different business model. So I just think it's, it's complicated. And this whole idea of scaling up so you can be bought, that's another level of conversation 
for mm -hmm. us to have. What is, you know, what is it that we're building? Is it more important? I mean, Ebony, I'm just sort of rambling here, but no, you know, we no. just see Ebony is now having an issue because it wasn't managed. So it's not black owned, but now it may not exist. So it's, it's right. complicated. Right. And what, what you're getting yeah, into is real cool. business. You know, that is, that's the kind of stuff you were talking about before. You're like, oh my goodness, I know what it means to be an entrepreneur, you know? And so this is exactly, you know, why the education is so important in our, in our platform to me and to us, you know, it's because there's so much that we just, we really just need to get the big picture. You know, we've been consumers for so long. We've been promoters of other people's stuff for so long, you know, that it's time for us to put all of that energy towards ourselves and our communities and really get into the, you know, get into the weeds about the kind of things you're talking about so that, you know, we, we, we're not looking at the Carol's daughter who's who's sold to another person and, and thinks she's a sellout. That's like the immediate thing people think or something, you know, we really need to understand business, you know, you know, that truly we are in, a, in business and we're in a, in a position of um, generational wealth, which is gets into contracts and different things that you just spoke of. So, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and it's, it's really interesting right now to be, because this is such a disruptive period of time where, you know, people were moving along, have been developing their businesses, and now, you know, they can't, people can't sell or they can't get capital or they can't pay their employees. And at the same time, there are some people who are creating businesses. Mm -hmm. Now that's easier said than done, but I'm sure you're seeing that with, you know, people who are just, they figured out some kind of way to create a product that, or to do some distribution or to use the internet. I mean, my God, if Madam Walker had had Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I was going to oh ask you about that. Yes. <laughs> That's she awesome. could have had her Instagram live on there. Yes. That's where the technology <laughs> piece comes in. And we talk about this quite often, how technology, again, supplements what you have. But you still have to have the business savvy to run a business mm -hmm. online you know, on site, whatever, it still takes an acumen of understanding where and how customer yes. consumption, marketing, you know, logistics, all of those things play a part. And I think people always just instantly think that tech is going to solve everything. It's just, oh, let me just get it. It doesn't do anything unless you work. It's one of those things. It only works when you do. And I do think like our educational process, we kind of have minded ourselves into this myopic thought of, you know, this is how you do it. We have been taught this over and over and we've definitely indoctrinated into our communities where it is just that singular path where again, to be exposed, not only from the aspect of, yep, I have to go to college in order to get this job. And the only jobs that I need to get are to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, because those pay me, which is a cultural phenomenon across the aspira, like you know, our diaspora preaches that. I, I've known many Caribbean and Africans who like, the only jobs in the world are to be a lawyer and, <laughs> and to be a doctor. And I'm like, there's so many other jobs and they're like, no, those are the only two. <laughs> you're like, okay. But that exposure I think is happening and that's where entrepreneurship really does take a, it needs to be looked upon as an avenue of expression, but also that it could be a revenue generator. And I think until we get that knowledge and get that kind of socialization that it doesn't have to be just a singular business, it can be multiple businesses and what kind. And we'll have the technology to support it, whatever you decide to do. We're here to help that part. Like that's where I think from a technological standpoint, there's always support. Whatever you want to do, we've already thought about it. We know exactly what, what can be done. You just better have to tell us what that business is. And I think that's where the 10K project is really trying to formulate different thought and mentality around what is business and what is the investment and from an entrepreneur side, like what are these things that we're now discussing for economic empowerment? So yeah. I saw a I wanted, question, somebody said, how can they invest? How can they become a part of this? I know, oh, Sherry, perfect. you said some of that, but just, I think somebody wanted to know more details. Yes, and we definitely want to give people more details. So uh, the way that the 10K project works is that you need to be a member first, a member of the community. And that is a one-time payment of $100. It's a lifetime payment. So what will happen is you, if you decide to, if you like what you hear, come to our website, the10kproject.com, take a look at what we're doing. Membership includes um, investor education, 
and we have a lot of information with regards to the knowledge center that we're putting together. You're going to learn how to do what's called due diligence or research on the projects that you, uh, are within the 10K project, how to build a portfolio. But we're also going to add other things in there like how to make more money, whether you want a side hustle or another main hustle or a better job, how to save money, how to put together a wealth plan, um, how to um, – develop like trust and family banks and things like that, things that the majority of us are not usually exposed to. That's going to be within that Investor Knowledge Center, and that is part of your $100 membership fee. You also will get to uh, look at all of the Bet on Black pitches. That's our style of Shark Tank pitches. And you will be able to listen to all of the entrepreneurs uh, and their businesses, the uh, businesses that they have. They will talk about you know, what their businesses are, uh, where they are in the process, how much money are they raising, what are they going to do with the money, when will you get your money back, how will you get your money back, all of those things. And then you get to read their business plan and you get to decide if you want to invest in that business. So we're going to start off, once we get our SEC approval, we're going to start off with one business a week just to get everybody's feet wet. But then the more members we have, the more businesses that will be able to come on the platform and raise money. So to become a member, come to the10kproject.com. There's a lot of information on there. Also, if you're new to us, you're automatically now going to be a part of our email list. We do a, um, a live every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time where we answer questions in depth. We have like a half-hour presentation, and then we answer all of your questions in depth. So if you go to the website and you're like, I still have questions, you can either email us, use the contact form, or come to that Monday live Q&A session that we have. So um, definitely. Was there another question? Because I did want to ask a, another question of you based on some of the things you had talked about. I don't know if there was I'm another good. question. No, no, I just, I just thought somebody wanted that information. We needed to make sure they knew how. So we, yes, <laughs> yes, and I thank you for helping us plug the uh, the 10K project. And really, we're building an ecosystem here, not just a, not just you know, hey, let's let's grab as many memberships as possible. We want to really help uh, build black wealth here. So, I wanted to ask a question about something you had mentioned earlier, and that was the legal assistance that your um, great-great-grandmother had, where she had the foresight to, you know, start off with a great product, because I do think that that's essential, start off with great marketing, which, hey, in this organization, like, uh, one of the primary people was like, marketing, marketing, really getting out there, but then having great legal representation, and this will be a little more controversial as well, because we will have people that will say, you know, um, we're we're usually not treated fairly in the eyes of society, in the eyes of the government, in the eyes of the law. You know, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are with regards to um, where we are today um, and how we can use equity crowdfunding, but also understanding maybe some of the challenges that our, our ancestors had and how we can position ourselves today uh, for success. Because, you know, that's something that people think about as well. And it's, a, it's, you know, it's an understandable concern. Yeah, well, just from the, the legal standpoint, there are just certain – there's certain part of the infrastructure that just really has to be tight because if it's not, it will come back to bite you. And you it's mm -hmm. paying your taxes, you know, making sure that you have the CPA and not just, you know, somebody who can do taxes, but somebody mm -hmm. who really understands and who can help you structure. Um, and having an attorney who really understands business and who is going to make sure that you are doing all the things, you know, whether it's trademark or copyright, you need a, you know, an intellectual property lawyer for that, but somebody who really can be there for you. And while you won't be able to afford an in-house counsel, you know, when you're just starting out, it really is important to pay that legal bill now, even though it, you know, 250 or 400 or $500 an hour sounds really, really horrible. If you don't, <laughs> 
do those things in the front, then you will have hundreds of thousands of dollars of liability. So it's kind of like you, you have to, you have to build that in. And that is certainly what made a huge difference for Madam Walker. F.B. Ransom, her attorney, was, um, he just really kept the threats away from her. And he was great at record keeping. And, and I will say one of the reasons I can tell Madam Walker's story now is because between her attorney and the secretary and some of the key people in her executive team, they saved every piece of paper. So I have literally tens of thousands of records and those have been digitized. It is the rare black owned company from the early 20th century that has the records. And you know, while we do a lot of things on the computer now, those disks need to be saved. We, we need to not only do that for the running of our business, but to leave a legacy so that a hundred yeah. years from now, whatever it is you're doing, somebody is writing about. Now this does give me an opportunity to mention something about the movie that was wrong. <laughs> Actually, so, yes, we wanted a little bit of tea on that. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let me just say it was very exciting yesterday to see that Octavia Spencer has been nominated uh, as a lead actress for an Emmy. Oh, and, fantastic. You know, along with Washington, and, you know, I mean, it's just a really, you know, great, uh, you know, great team. And she was the bright spot for me because while I had, you know, a lot of issues with the historical inaccuracies um, and some mm -hmm. of the storylines, and some of the characters who were made up, she, for me, every time she appeared on screen, embodied what I know about many, many years of research about Madam Walker, the courage, the tenacity, what it takes to build a business, the vulnerability, you know, so I loved Octavia Spencer in that role. So I am, you know, all cool with Octavia. <laughs> but in terms of this, you know, the lawyer piece, one of the things that, among other things that bothered me, the Addie Monroe character, that was horrible because Annie, the real Annie yeah. Malone was, you know, truly a competitor of Madam Walker's, was not, it was not about color, skin color, it's just, you know, that was wow. something I would totally not have done had I had any control over it. Mm -hmm. um, the Esther character was made up, that, you know, Lilia did not have a girlfriend. I, this was just the conceit of the script writers. I would <laughs> let that out. Booker T. Washington was misportrayed. But in terms of Mr. Ransom, he was such a key player for her. And he was a straight arrow. He had taken an oath at 12 years old to never drink, smoke, or gamble. So for there to be this character, Sweetness, who was a pimp and a numbers runner, supposedly his cousin, not true, who had him bet on the numbers and then that hit um, what became an investment in the Walker Company, what that says is Black businesses can't survive unless there's some uh, illegal mm -hmm. money. Yeah. yeah. And so that's a stereotype that really made me unhappy because that's not, wow. and yes, it is true that, you know, one of my best friend's mothers hit the numbers in Indianapolis and she was able to build a new kitchen, you know, when we were growing up. Okay. And, you know, it's not like the, <laughs> No, yeah. But it was the lottery. It was just the illegal lottery. <laughs> it's not like I have anything literally against that. But I'm just right. saying that was not the case here. Yeah. Right. And actually, it made, in the movie, it made your, you know, great-great-grandmother very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. It really made the business very vulnerable. Whereas here, what you've talked about with the legal, and I want to say this, the legal, she wasn't just saying this for us as the equity crowdfunding portal. She's saying this for all entrepreneurs out there, whether or not you're raising equity crowdfunding money or you're going to the bank or, you know, or you're just doing self-funding, you do want to have your records together. You do want to have proper representation with regards to who's doing your taxes, um, my mother is a bookkeeper, and the old joke is people always want to blame the 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 bookkeeper and the accountant. However, they never go to jail, and they never get the fine. Okay, you're still you're still responsible for signing off on the taxes and, and attesting that yes, these numbers are correct, right? So um, so it's very it's very important for us to um, be conscious of our our record keeping and this goes back to what Talisha and I are always talking about with the digitizing of you know every company is a tech company is what Talisha says and 
I was very disturbed when I saw the Robert Smith 2% solution. I don't know if people are familiar with this, but the billionaire Robert Smith was the gentleman that uh, paid off all the Morgan, is that Morgan State, Morehouse, Morehouse, Morehouse College students' loans a couple of years ago, if people remember that. And he came out with something called the 2% solution where he was saying uh, all of the, the large companies out there, if they just put 2% of their uh, net profits each year into black banks, then the banks could, our banks could fund black businesses. Well, one of the things that he said that uh, we should also do with this money is digitize a million black businesses. And I'm asking, well, why are those businesses not digitized? And, you know, we had that conversation internally uh, at our last uh, members-only meeting. And the fact that we just um, – we have so much going on. We have so few people. We don't have enough staff or the right amount of staff to uh, properly take care of our businesses because our businesses are like another child, you know. You wouldn't say, oh, I can't feed – little Johnny today, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, little, little, you know, um, Sarah, she doesn't get a bath today. Uh, I know it's been six months <laughs> since, since she's gotten any exercise, but hey, you know, <laughs> no, so, so, and, but it's, it's also, there are parts of our businesses that, and I've been guilty of this too, that you neglect. And, how can we have that self-care? And I know we're, we're in, uh, coming to the end of our hour here, but I do think what you said is very important, and it needs to be something that we are conscious of, and we figure out how to utilize the tools, the technology, the resources, the 10K Project community in order to take care of our businesses, of our investment portfolio, you know, et cetera. Otherwise, um, we could end up in, in that legal kind of issue. Um, so with that, uh, somebody's asking oh, about the replay. So, yes, the replay will definitely be available if you registered. And I think this is good enough for us to also put on YouTube and places like that. Also, I always like to see where the conversation is going to go um, and how controversial it's going to be before I put it up on all social media. But I think this, is, this has been a pretty, uh, a pretty even-keeled discussion, so we'll definitely have it up as well. So, yeah, someone's saying they missed the first half. So we'll definitely make sure to get you the replay. Uh, but with that, I always like to go around and give people like a final word. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with Dr. Keisha. A final word for the family based on all of the information we talked about today. Oh, I just want to do again, thank our, our guests today and, and all of our guests listening. Um, one of the big things I, I wanted to leave with the family is that we really do have something to offer beyond money a lot of times you know what we're doing in this uh, space is is changing some mindsets that's the first big move you know that we can be we can work together as black people that seems to be a an idea that that circulates in our community we can work together and we have what we need to to make the impact that we really need to to, to make when we work together so um I invite everyone to look at us very closely and, and join us, the 10K Project. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Eric. Oh, I just want to thank you, um, uh, Ms. Bundles, just for taking the time. Like, it, it is just fantastic because you're just a bridge and a window into the past with Madam Walker, who's just one of our great heroes. And just to be able to look back and to be able to pull so much of those nuggets that you dropped just during this discussion, to me, that, that, that's just been invaluable. I'm a lover of history, lover of black history. So thank you so much for taking time today. Talisha? Thanks for that great question. <laughs> <laughs> he always asks great questions. And thank you again. We'll echo that. Um, it's been a wonderful pleasure to just speak with you. And again, I think it's amazing what you do. I've followed your work for quite some time. So it's very nice to have you here. There is a question that I'll forego here to make sure someone asks they, what, what they can do to contact you publicly. Do you have an email, a publicist, a website? So we want to make sure our, um, our guests have some access to you as well. So if you have that information, we will gladly Absolutely. share that. Absolutely. And so, you know, I am my people. So then, <laughs> but, 
but I do have a website. It's uh, aleliabundles.com, A-L-E-L-I-A bundles.com, and madamcjwalker.com, M-A-D-A-M, no E, M-A-D-A-M-C-J-Walker.com. And forgive the, uh, you can hear the um, lawnmower that's outside. So that just, just happened, of course. Um, but I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Alelia Bundles. So I would love to hear from folks. And my books are On Her Own Ground, The Life and Times of Madam C.J. Walker, which also has, has the uh, self-made movie tie-in title. It's exactly the same book, but one has Octavia Spencer's name on the cover. And you can get that from my website or from independent black bookstores uh as well as amazon thank you yeah. so much. and if somebody did ask about the 7 30 p.m tonight creating your wealth plan uh webinar i put the link in eventbrite for everybody so if you all want to come learn about how to create your own wealth plan or if you're not available tonight, but you still want to hear the information, as long as you register, we will send you the replay, okay? So I wanted to make sure to uh, mention that as well. Uh, Ms. Bundles, do you have any final words of encouragement, thoughts? Again, I also want to reiterate, it was an honor and a pleasure to have you here with us um, as well. Um, no, I'm, I'm just, I love what you're doing. It's so important. Um, this is the privilege uh, and the opportunity that Madam Walker provides for me that I get to meet folks like you all. So I will be following what you're doing. And I do um, usually like to leave folks with some words from Madam Walker. And she said that people often ask her the secret to her success. And she would say to them, there is no royal flower strewn path to success. And if there is, I have not found it. For whatever success I have attained, has been the result of much hard work and many sleepless nights. I got my start by giving myself a start. So don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. You have to get up and make them for yourself. Amen. And with that, we're going to uh, leave that there. Felicia, check your email. Uh, give me about 20 minutes, and I will make sure to get that link to you as well uh, for tomorrow night's webinar on the uh, Family Bank. So thank you so much. Thank you for spending your lunchtime with us, and God bless everyone. We hope you have a great day. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.